And good afternoon, everybody. This is North Star Oasis. Thank you for joining us. My, my name is Jeff Williams, your host for this next hour. Um, this is Saturday, December 20th. We are four, day, four days away from Christmas Eve and five days away from the big day itself. Uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays, everybody. Um, we're broadcasting live from the studios at Suburban Community Channels in White Bear Lake, Minnesota, and as well as uh, you'll see us on Channel 15 and SPNN in St. Paul. And well, with the rest of our viewing audience, we just want to say thank you for joining us. And I'll let you know we are on Twitter. Please follow us on Twitter, at North Star Oasis. Uh, we're going to be pu putting up our show, uh, links to our shows on Twitter, along with some local news that'll, that might interest you and some of the other clips and things that we see on this show. Uh, right now, I want to bring you up with some breaking news. Uh, this actually I heard about as we came in, uh, as I was coming into the studio today, uh, just less than an hour ago. Uh, an armed man walked up to two New York Police Department officers sitting inside a patrol car and opened fire Saturday afternoon, striking them both before running into a nearby subway station and apparently committing suicide, police said. The shooting took place in Brooklyn. Uh, both officers were rushed to Woodhull Hospital. At least one of the officers was shot in the head, police said. Authorities say the suspect shot himself inside the subway and is believed to be dead. And then, of course, the shooting comes at a time when the police are being heavily criticized for the tactics following the chokehold death of Eric Garner. Uh, several officers have been assaulted at New York City protests during demonstrations that have been largely peaceful. No other details were immediately available. This just happened uh, just within the last couple of hours. This is the state of where we're at in society today. Uh, we seem to be having almost a civil war on our hands. Um, and here we have these protests blocking off the streets. They're saying Black Lives Matter. Well, guess what, folks? Unborn lives matter. Disabled lives matter. Veterans' lives matter. Lives matter. That should be the message that we're teaching here, is that lives matter, not just one subset of our culture at, 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 at large. You know, we should value every human life. And it's really sad when now we're having a war with police where we're, you know, people are, are killing police indiscriminately because of their emotions. And it's really, really sad. I wanted to bring that up, but I also want to transition. I don't want to spend the whole hour talking about this. And, you know, we tried a couple of weeks ago talking about race relations. But I want to set this up. You know, this gunman, he ended up uh, committing suicide. You know, this is a lonely time of year. This is a time when we have people who feel that they're broken people, you really feel like they're broken. And I guess what I'm trying to say here is we look at homelessness, we look at veterans, and we're at that point now where we're getting out of war. We're, we're, we've de-escalated, uh, we've pulled out of Iraq, we've pulled out of Afghanistan, and this is the first year in at least 12 years now that I haven't heard any of the holiday greetings on uh, radio and TV. You're not, we're not seeing the mass um, marketplace from the hometown news service of the various uh, branches with the, hi, I'm so-and-so from so-and-so wishing all my family and friends in this town a happy, a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. We're not hearing that this year. Now, when I look at the uh, USO website, USO tours, uh, Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Tinker Air Force Base, Oklahoma, then mainland Japan, Guam, and Hawaii, uh, South Korea, Kuwait. But this year, Iraq and Afghanistan is missing. And let's hope in the long term that we can have some stability and peace in that region of the world. But that brings me back to an experience that happened 11 years ago. It was 11 years ago this past week where I was stationed in, in um, Kirkuk Air Base, Iraq. My job was public affairs. We also assisted the protocol officer. And what we ended up doing was working with the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and the USO in bringing the uh, holiday goodwill and entertainment to the rest of the troops. 
And on this particular trip in December of 2003, this is right after Saddam Hussein was captured. And so for all of us who were working there, we were putting in 20-hour days. You know, our uh, eyelids drooped down to our knees. I mean, that's how exhausted we were. And here, the USO brought in some great entertainers. They brought in Leanne Tweeden uh, from Fox Sports, uh, the best damn sh sports show period. They brought in, um, I'm trying to remember who else they brought in, uh, I believe Dallas Cowboy cheerleaders, Kurt Angle, the wrestler, so they, and Mike Wallace, the NASCAR driver. They brought in a, a bunch of people. And when the entertainers arrived, they came off the C-17, and they grabbed their bags, and they walked. There was one little short guy who looked around, and he saw that he had the same last name as me, because our names were imprinted on our, on our uh, uniforms. And it was Robin Williams. And he comes over to me and goes, hey, Brother Williams. And I looked at him and said, hey, Brother Robin, thanks for being here. And so we chit-chatted for a little bit, and I handed him a coin that, we, that the previous rotation at our base had made, and I handed it to him and it said, embracing the suck. And he laughed, uh, because when you're in Iraq and under the conditions we were, I mean, embracing the suck kind of epitomized the, the state of where we were. He went out and did the show, fabulous show, and then... Right afterwards, I was taking photos of him during his performance. I was ended up right at the end of the stage. And when he finished his performance, he walked directly over to me. And this is the first show on this USO tour. And so he was still working out the, the kinks in his jokes, you know, making sure everything was smooth. And very, very humbly, he came over to me and said, Hey, Brother Williams, how'd I do? And I, like every other troop, was blown away and looked at him and I said, you did fabulous. Thanks for being here. We really needed this. And that was a little bit of an insight into the humanity of Robin Williams. Here, this is a man that we've seen him since his Mork and Mindy and Happy Days days. We've watched him on film. We've watched him in Jumanji, Good Morning Vietnam, and a bunch of other films. And we've seen him on television. We've seen him, you know, in live performances. I remember his 2002 uh, live, uh, HBO special, um, you know, cracked up people left and right and center. Millions of people just adored him. And for just that one moment, I got a chance to see his stage fright and his uncertainty. So a big name entertainer, but he was still a man. He was still a little bit unsure of himself. But when we don't have a USO show, and then with his unfortunate passing, his suicide in August, I just felt that today would be the right time to show uh, a little excerpt from one of the USO shows that he had done in 2004, a year after uh, I had met him. He was in Al Assad uh, base, uh, Marine Corps base in Iraq. And so we're going to show you that now. And if you notice, there was uh, John Elway, Leanne Tweeden was here for this. We also, they also had Blake Clark, another comedian who was there. And there's Blake Clark. And take a look at how many Marines were at this particular area. And here's the entrance of Robin Williams. I'm coming over there, man. Uh, 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 and when we see 
<laughs> and we've seen, we hear how many of the troops who were deployed really looked up to this man. I hope you can understand when watching this piece exactly why he mattered and why military members were so shattered at his, at his uh, unfortunate passing. And in the interest of trying to keep this a family-friendly production, uh, I have taken the liberty of leaping out the few profanity uh, lace pieces he put in, and at the same time, uh, make sure that we did the cleanest job that we possibly could with his jokes that were still funny. And take a look at all of the troops you're waiting for. Him. great actors of our time. Um, what a great human being. Very intelligent, very smart, brilliant, funny, witty, knowledgeable. I mean, I can't say enough about him. I mean, he's really just a very, very cool guy. And uh, it's kind of, you know, I'm even like, oh, I'm traveling with this guy. So please give it up, everybody. And I want to hear a loud Marine welcome for Mr. Robin Wyatt. Kidding. <laughs> Damn it. Oh, we still have no electricity. We hopefully will pay the bills by next week. <laughs> Taking a little fundraiser thing, but hey, I thank you for the ride in on the C-130. That's a... Yeah! That's a great plane if you're <laughs> deaf. Thank you. It's nice to get off that plane and go, thank you for the ride. I felt like Jimmy the Special Boy. Nice to be here. Nice to be on a plane that so out even Marley Maitland would go, I'm okay. Before we show, okay, Bobby, thank you. The guys up in the back are hackling. I'm a sniper, I can get you from here. <laughs> it's so nice, and they, you have no alcohol, obviously. Here you have the, uh, you have the, what was it, the non-alcoholic beer, 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 beer? Fake beer, 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 fake beer. Yes, that's it, Tommy. <laughs> Fake beer. Yeah, I'm so loaded. <laughs> How many beers did you have? 400. <laughs> Very careful. Oh, this is so, and there's all this camouflage. It's cool. You've got the Marines wearing digital camouflage. <laughs> it's like your whole body's in witness protection. That's so cool. <laughs> Don't, you can't see me. I love the guys though. The, everybody else is in desert camouflage. There's one guy wearing like jungle green, and I guess he didn't get the memo. <laughs> Either that or 
they have deer hunting in Iraq. I like the green one. It's like, if you have green, you're going to the desert, man. And you're going, I'm hiding behind the one bush. Be very, very quiet. I'm looking for terrorists. Semper Fi, do you know that? Ow! That's a scary noise. You hear, ow! Okay. Little Christmas decoration. <laughs> and the one tree in all of Iraq going. <laughs> the one pine tree planted ten years ago. <laughs> oh, you okay, Sergeant? I'll look over this way. <laughs> Put on the hat, the <laughs> Jesus, nice hat. <laughs> Many of you will have clothing that won't fit. I think. Oh, thank you. I'm hand that back now. The guy's going, great, I have to pay for it now. <laughs> also, uh, back home, uh, you've seen, uh, there's been a brief problem with uh, steroids again. Uh, baseball players taking steroids and, you know, it's drugs. Uh, not like the old days where Dale Strawberry snorted third base. But... <laughs> I can understand doing maybe a little speed with baseball, makes the game go a little quicker, get that running around the base. You're gonna have to get the out! Okay, next base. I'm gonna get my children quiet. Sit down, sit down. I'm Feels like we're about to have a sing-along, like kumbaya. <laughs> It's so nice having a whole front row, like sitting at an NRA convention. <laughs> it's just like this, people going, if you're not funny, I know where you are. <laughs> nice to see you here. <laughs> but you do have the big car. I noticed that the used car lot out there is pretty cute. You have the, you got the Hummers, you got the Striker, which is pretty much the ultimate <laughs> car. I can't wait till someone starts buying the first civilian Bradleys going, I need a parking space. I'm sorry. <laughs> I have one now. Kids, we're going to the store. Back out of the car. Get to there. Both of you, go for the ice cream now. Bring it in. Mom is upstairs. She's on the twin fifties. She will cover you till you get to the back. Her sister's watching the side. Envelop, encircle, take out the butcher. But things aren't that bad. <laughs> And now, before I head off over here, I want to thank the electricians. We, um... <laughs> you guys did a good job. <laughs> but in a weird way, this has been kind of really sweet, fun, intimate, quiet time. <laughs> you guys are doing an amazing job. That's why we came here. We want to wish you a Merry Christmas. Santa's coming in. We're just bolting on the iron right now. <laughs> He's got two elves manning a 50 in the back. <laughs> and the reindeers are dropping flares out of the... <laughs> so I came here to wish you Merry Christmas, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Kwanzaa, and damn, you guys are the best, Semper Fi, and also Army, British oh. people, Australian people, all the people, coalition people. You are the best. Thank you all. And there you have it. That was just the excerpts. The actual production, the show uh, went on for about you know, twice, almost three times that length. But we, we trimmed it uh, back a bit. But that was the spirit in which Robin Williams brought the smiles and the enthusiasm uh, to the troops who were serving. And, and some of the, a lot of these guys, some, not a lot of them, but some of these guys, they never returned. You know, he gave us the smiles. The USO did a fabulous job. And some of these guys, they were killed in action, died of wounds. I mean, things like that happened. This is this, this, this war. And so as I think back to Robin Williams and I think back to the struggles, you know, when we were on the, on the line, many, you know, 20-hour days, we had an inner fortitude that kept us going, that let us continue. And unfortunately, Robin Williams lost that. And so on this Christmas... In this holiday season, even though he's gone, he hasn't been forgotten. Now, that reminds me here, as we look at celebrities, you know, a lot of people really looked up to Robin Williams, going back to his happy days and, and uh, Mork and Mindy days. And 
how often is it that people get a chance to interact with their celebrities? First of all, if you have interacted with Robin Williams uh, or any other USO show, feel free to tell us that story. Just send us a tweet at North Star Oasis. We are on Twitter. We would love to hear from you. And then I want to transition now into another celebrity. Uh, when I grew up, Petra, a Christian rock group, they were my favorite band. And, you know, these guys were just, I thought, amazing musicians. And they came up with a song in 1989 called Homeless Few. And if I just recall off the top of my head, without singing, uh, uh, some of the lyrics were under the red, white, and blue, right down the street uh, in our view. We're not doing all we can do to shelter the homeless few. And it was really a great, uh, I can't say great, it was really inspiring uh, song that they came out with. This was on their On Fire album in 1989. A few years later, uh, one of the uh, guitarists, uh, Pete Orta, had left the band. And he and his wife decided to operate their own homeless shelter in uh, Texas, where, the, where they're from. And Pete and Kelly have done a fabulous job taking uh, homeless youth off the streets, giving them love and at the same time giving them some uh, accountability and the guidance they need in their lives. And so they created In Triumph, which you can uh, visit them at intriumph.org. And they've done fabulous work down there. And, and they, they had a little bit of a difficulty earlier this year. And Pete, who I've gotten a chance to know over the last few years, he and I really had... Uh, solidified a friendship and so it's it's rare that you actually find that the people that you look up to in your youth you know you become friends with them when when you're uh, an adult and I've had that opportunity with Pete and again there's not a whole lot I wouldn't do for him uh, and his uh, shelter in triumph but now the question is what is being done here in the Twin Cities are we doing anything like this? Are we doing anything with the homeless? And there are a lot of homeless or, uh, or, or oriented organizations that are out there. And some of them are doing fabulous work. Some of them are just going to ask for more government handouts and not have the accountability in there. But I want to tell you or show you uh, one group that is really starting to do something just in their short time in existence. And that group is called Life Prep Academy. And I've got one of their uh, brochures right here. And our producer, uh, Dallas, and I, we kind of crashed their uh, holiday open house yesterday. And we had a chance to meet some of the people there. And, we, and we've, um, well, thanks to Dallas, he's put together this segment right here. Okay, so Pam, can you tell us about the history of Life Prep, Life Prep Academy? Uh, well, the history, uh, first of all, in concept, has been at, at least a decade in the making. Um, I've been a teacher for 28 years, and um, throughout the years, uh, at different times, uh, seeing a need for kids who are in high school who um, were high-risk kids, uh, I, I worked at Lino uh, at the juvenile center there and I would see kids who would intentionally sabotage themselves when they were coming off probation and just because they knew where they were was a good place for them, that they were safe, um, they had people who cared about them and, and it just didn't make sense that you know, kids should have to commit a crime in order to be in a setting you know, that's good for them. Um, that was one part of it. The other part is the huge homelessness problem that we have. Um, one area we're looking at that we're focusing on is Anoka County, but we're definitely not limited to Anoka County. But in Anoka County alone, statistically about 500 youth per night are, are unattached, homeless. And so those two concepts kind of came together and the timing was right and, and felt that maybe this was a niche that we could find a way of addressing, um, making sure the kids' basic needs were being met as well as then being able to um, give them a good education where they weren't having to worry about all those other things and so so how long did it take you to put to form the board of directors and get the early funding in order to come up with this concept in this location well the the 
getting the board of directors was a lot, a lot easier than I thought it was going to be. <laughs> Basically, it was uh, I had two people in mind: um, Roger Chamberlain, who was a senator, and Ron Hansen, who was a pastor. And I went to each of them and told them what my thoughts were, and um, you know, a mission that I felt called to do, and asked if they would be willing to be on board with it and and be a part of it. And they both jumped on right away and it just kind of went from there. You had three people that had never done anything like this before. So when, when did that planning start? Uh, it would have been about a year ago, September, I think. September, October of 2013 was when we actually um, filed as a business. Okay. Um, so a little over a year. And then how did you settle on this location? This location, like everything that has happened along the process was a godsend. Um, it is actually the one and only location we looked at. Um, I had put some feelers out there. I was looking for places. Actually, I was looking for places like up in Blaine or, or Ham Lake. Um, and then I had a realtor that emailed me and said, I have this location. Um, I think it looks like what you're looking for. And um, I came over and looked at it. It was like, perfect. And so there was no reason to. So this is the only one that we looked at because it was just, okay. it, it was a perfect fit. So when did you open your doors? We started renting the building August 1st, um, spent August painting and getting the building ready and, and working on, you know, continuing to, to raise, raise money. Uh, September, um, I was here, uh, then we started putting more of the educational part of it together. What are we going to teach? What's the curriculum going to be? So we started that aspect with the goal of taking on students by October 1st. Uh, Mid-September, we were thinking, oh, we're not going to be ready by October 1st. And last week of September, we got a phone call. We have a kid. Can you take him? And yep, so we started October 1st. And so our original plan ended up being what we were actually able to do. Wow. So we took our first kid in October. So how many students do you have now? Currently, we have two. Okay. Currently, two we right have now. two. We have two that we've accepted. Um, we've had others that have called, um, and they just were not a fit for the program. But uh, we've taken two. Uh, in our current situation, we would probably take two more um, until we raise the twenty-five thousand dollars to get another house to rent. Uh, we'll stick with just the one house that would have maximum of four kids. So where are the students living now? Well, currently they're living with uh, my husband and me. Um, and like I said, we'll take up to four uh, because our first student was a boy. We're going to take only boys. So once we get the $25,000 chunk of money, we will um, rent another house, and that one would be girls. And then the next $25,000, um, again, we'll see kind of what the need is if that becomes a boy or a girl house. Uh, the $25,000 represents a full year's worth of rent, utilities, food, so it could cover for an entire year. We don't want to get into a situation where three months down the road we run out of money and, you know, sorry, kid, you're back out on the street. So uh, we want to make sure that we have enough to... Um, be able to provide for that kid for an entire year. What are the criteria that, that you require for a student to be here? First of all, they need to be either homeless, at risk of becoming homeless, or have other critical issues going on at home. Uh, easy way I explain to people, if you think of a kid that would be qualified for a foster care situation, um, would be an additional type of kid that we would um, accept. Uh, a kid where there's just too many things that are going on in their life at home that is getting in the way of their education and other um, parts of their life. And so um, those are the kinds of kids that we are looking to, um, to uh, draw in here. So they need to be one of those criteria. They need to be drug free. They need to be um, no major emotional or um, behavioral problems. We are not a treatment center. so. You know, uh, I am licensed in EBD, and our other teachers are licensed in EBD, so we can EBD handle uh, emotional behavioral disorders. Okay. So we can take, you know, some behaviors, but not, um, you know, excessive violent behaviors or anything like that. So we're, like I said, we're not a treatment center, so we can't, we won't take them that um, far along. And um, they need to have a motivation to learn. And so it's the kid who, you know, has these roadblocks getting in the way, but if you took away the roadblocks, they would they would flourish and so we we're not taking the kids kicking and screaming making them come to school we are saying to the kid here's an opportunity 
we'll give you a place to live, we'll make sure you're fed, we'll make sure you have clothes, we'll help you learn all the skills you need to be an independent adult, we'll help you get into college if you want to go to college, we'll help you get a job if you want a job. So we're going to handle all those things, but you have to follow these rules and you have to be willing to, or you have to be motivated to get your education. What happens if you get a student who doesn't obey the rules? Have you figured that out yet? Well, um, you know, it's going to be a case-by-case -case situation. I mean, we're all human and we all make mistakes, so, I, you know, we'll be a little more lenient with mistakes. If it's a kid who's just being um, defiant, we don't have to have them here. I mean, this is a private school. It's all privately funded from people voluntarily donating money, and so um, they need to understand, and that's a big part of it, is they understand that this is an opportunity for them. It's not a punishment. It's not something they have to be doing, so they can choose to walk out the door anytime they want to. So for your two students, can you walk us through a typical day with them? Uh, we just ended our first quarter, and a typical day, um, we have a senior and we had a sophomore. So there's going to be some classes that they both need to take, and they'll be together in those classes. There's going to be some classes that um, they will work on independently. And we have um, three uh, licensed teachers that are covering all the subjects. We have one student who actually is far enough along in his credits that he will be attending two classes at Rasmussen College, in college next uh, quarter. Uh, they have, it's a similar to a PSEO program that is run through the college, so he'll be taking two classes there. And so he'll have some other classes here, but he'll be able to get a few college credits under his belt. Yes. What? Um, well, there are, there are certain um, courses that they need to take um, that we are, we're following all the same um, types of classes that you would find in any other high school. Um, we have licensed teachers, which technically in a private school you don't even have to have a licensed teacher. And we will take advantage of um, other individuals who aren't licensed, um, you know, for a computer class or other certain uh, interest type of classes. Um, but right now we're, our three teachers are, are licensed teachers, and so um, uh, we've got all the same classes covered. The difference is we add a lot of independent living skills. So the kids are required to get some job skills and independent skills, which includes sewing, cooking, you know, how to be out on your own. When the kids graduate from here, we want them to be able to be individuals that can function on their own. They know what to do. They know how to find the help that they need. They know how to find a job. They know how to, you know, find all, all the things that they need um, as an adult. And so we have not just the core curriculum classes, but we have a lot of additional enrichment and um, teaching that actually involves them becoming adults. Take us down the road for your vision. Where would you like to see this program in five or ten years? Um, well, five, ten years from now, I'd love to be able to move to another spot where we buy five to ten acres of land, build a larger school, have a boys dorm and a girls dorm, and are able to service probably around 80 to 100 kids. That would be a long term. And then the next step as well is to be able to have the homes become our transitional places. So what we're using now is their residences. I would like those to become transitions so that when they leave the school, the dorm, once we eventually get it, um, they would go to one of the homes and that would be their transition into you know going to college, working, whatever, till they can fully you know be on their own. So we're not you know combining high school and 20 year olds together. All right. Anything you want to add to our viewers? Uh, no, other than we have plenty of room for, we need volunteers, uh, we need finances. Like I said, we are all um, independent donor, individual donors. Uh, we do not get any taxpayer dollars. And in this first couple of years, we don't get any grants because most of the grants, you have to have two years under your belt. So we're kind of on a month-to-month thing right now and um, we don't know of any you know multimillionaires are going to be giving us large checks in the near future so not yet, not yet. <laughs> no not yet so we're happy to take a whole bunch of ten dollar checks um, and we are just playing it month by month we kind of took a leap of faith and said you know here we go and uh, surviving one month at a time from now and like I said once we get a couple months in our, under our belt then we should be able to hopefully find some other sources through grants and whatnot. So if there's any grant writers, we'd love to have some grant writers come on board. <laughs> and how long have you worked here? 
um, since this fall. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's, what's your background in teaching? Um, I am a science teacher, so I taught for a couple of years before I had my first child. And then I worked at the Science Museum. So coming here, um, was it a culture shock from what you were used to, or did you just feel like you fit right in? I, I feel like I fit right in, so I've always been just a very flexible person, and that comes out in how I teach also, so it's just a really good fit. How many students do you teach? Uh, right now, two. <laughs> okay, that helps. Yeah, yeah. So it's been a good fit, so I have two little girls at home, so I'm able to still, still be with them and spend a lot of time with them, so... And then, yeah. what's the uh, biggest blessing that you've encountered so far? Oh, it's it's just been amazing. Uh, such a blessing to be able to teach and yeah, still be home, and that's a priority. And just feel really strongly about you know the whole mission and, and what we're doing. So just to partner with that is Can you just tell a us one story that really touched you since you've been here. Mm. I just I've loved um, you know really getting to know both the students but just yeah having that really individualized time with them and just being another strong adult and being there to listen and I don't know yeah that we can talk about like last quarter it was chemistry and we're doing that but also just talking life and yeah it's pretty awesome tell me what do we so this is this is what Pam wrote okay, Sunday. okay this is one of her favorite quotes so you're and then the other day we were talking about, Lee and I were talking about poems and, and prose and quotes. And he said, well, I have a favorite quote. And I said, okay, what, what is that? And he said, well, I'll write it on the board. So he walked over and wrote it down and I said, well, why would you think there's no tomorrow? She said, because there is And I said, well, there may have been some bad yesterdays, but there's always tomorrows, always good tomorrows. And he said, Okay, and I said, and that's why you think of prioritizing your tomorrows, because there will be good tomorrows. And that's what I told him. So what was his response to that? So he said, oh. People's found a new best friend. Yeah. And he's kind of thinking about that then. So he's planted the seed of something better than what his, his uh, yesterdays were. Because he's had some bad yesterdays. So. Wow, that's good to hear. Yeah. So. Um, where the majority of the, the classes are taking place right now. Um, you see we still have a remnant, remnant of chemistry on the board. Um, reception area, now one thing to think about when we're going through all this stuff is that everything in here has been donated. So all of this office furniture, everything you see in here, the chairs, everything in here has been donated. And so it's nothing that we have had to purchase. Um, we've had everything from the generosity of people making those donations. This is our multi-purpose room. On this side we have classroom where we have a range of classes. It's also where we will be eating lunch as we increase in numbers. The middle area is our assembly area where we can watch documentaries on the TV. That's our version of a smart board. And then on the far area, that is our recreation area where they can, during uh, lunch time or passing time, they can take some time to just relax. And we'll go this way. This is, this is our version of our, of our lockers. Each student has their own drawer. Uh, they ha don't really need any more space than that, so they each have their own drawers. And then our bathroom, and this is our other eating area right now. When we are small numbers, we just eat in here. Uh, as we grow, this will become another classroom. How and then just anticipate you can, you can get within this facility? Uh, up to 20 students. Up to, well, up to 20 people can be here, so we probably would not take more than, I would say, 16 maximum, maybe up to 20, kind of depends on, on circumstances, um, but definitely not more than 20 because it's um, fire code not big enough with just the one bathroom. We have to have uh, more bathrooms if we have more than 20 people. So, so yep, yeah, and then the middle one is my office, but <laughs> we don't need to see that one. <laughs> And that's it. That's our school. <laughs>
I said these these uh, stockings were all made by one of our students um, as a part of a sewing class, and he took off and his talents just went wild. He uh, uh, this is all natural. We just taught him the basic stitch, and he seems to be a sewing prodigy and, and made about 26 to 30 Christmas stockings this week. Well, how many have your name on them, though? <laughs> all of them that don't sell. <laughs> so Pam, what do you mean? What do you mean, faith based? Uh, Faith-based means that um, all of our um, all of our instructors and staff are Christians, and we teach from a perspective of the Christian faith. Uh, we do not call ourselves a Christian school because these are going to be kids that aren't necessarily coming from Christian homes, and they're not like a t typical Christian school where they're um, you know learning Latin or or learning the coming with the idea that they already know something about a Bible here. You might get a student, you mention John 3.16, and they say, who is John, and what's 316 got to do with anything? So um, so everything that we teach is um, from a perspective of a, of a Christian faith. And, and as a public school teacher, I sent my children to a Christian school, and I know that they were safer there because you have some values, beliefs, etc. So where do you get your support from? 100% donors. 100% wow. donors. Is there a church body that supports you? or We are not affiliated with any mm -hmm. one church. Um, we do have um, a, ton of church, uh, a ton of support from New Brighton Christian Church. They've pretty much adopted us. I'm hoping to be adopted by about four or oh, five more churches. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> yes. Yes. I understand. So like, how does no, um, you know, the Constitution was founded on, on Christian beliefs, um, so, you know, we can include that in there, that uh, that's, you know, where our, our roots come from in the United States. Um, you know, economics, we uh, work on personal finance with kids and responsibility with their finances, so, um, you know, any way that you can, you know, look at whatever perspective, it's going to be, you know, kind of along the old line of what would Jesus do, what would... <laughs> <laughs> what does the Bible say and how to deal with different things? Um, so that's the perspective we'll take. Okay. I found in the classroom that I would tell the kids right up front that I was a Christian. And on occasion, there'd be some student that asked me, well, how do you feel about abortion? I said, as a Christian, I would be opposed to it. And when I had to implement, you know, uh, following the rules at school, and, you know, sometimes you hear words that aren't acceptable and I'd walk up and say there's a school rule against it and as a Christian I personally take that as offense. Uh, you, you, you have kids that you're going to remove from the home with the, with the agreement of the parents, correct? Actually, or these are they, kids are primarily are homeless. And so. I, I had kids and you know it broke my wife's heart that some of these kids are throwaways, not wanted and they should be loved and cared for, like you're doing. So, how are the kids finding? You? Are you? Is it the kids finding you? Or the, kids is it are the, the kids are finding us. Um, we are. It's a. It's a tough spot we're in right now because there's, you know, hundreds of kids that exist in a situation that would benefit from this program. Don't need that. Um, Right now, while we are building funds, we are not um, advertising for kids because the, the worst thing in the world for me is for a kid to come to me and, and want to be here and we have no room for them. So right now, it's just a matter of most of our effort is, is being worked on with um, finding the funds. As soon as we raise $25,000, we'll go rent a house that we can put eight kids in. And then the next $25,000, we'll go rent another house for eight kids. Um, but we have our feelers out there. Um, Hope for Youth knows about us. Um, uh, law enforcement knows about us. The county knows about us. Um, Lionel Lakes, where I used to work, knows about us, and that's where our primary connections are right now. Um, but they know we exist, and, and so they are utilizing. We've actually um, we've accepted two students, turned down three students, and have one pending. Turned so, it down because? Because they weren't under our criteria. The criteria is they have to be homeless or at risk of becoming homeless. Um, they have to be um, drug free, um, severe uh, mental or chemical issues. Um, they have to have show a willingness to learn. 
Um, so we had one student who um, really was just looking for a way out of their situation. They had yep. no yep. no plans whatsoever to buy into the program. We had another one who was a girl, and because we started out with boys, yep. I, I have to take all boys right now for the next probably two more students until we get another house. Um, and another one was a situation where the first questions out of their mouth was, well, can I wear yoga pants? Well, if they're worried about what kind of pants they can wear, <laughs> if they don't follow the rules, they're just going to go back home. We don't want the kids that can go back home. Um, that's the whole point of this, is that they don't have a home to go back to. So um, they just didn't fit. And the kids all um, look at our rules and our expectations, and they sign a contract that they can um, live by our expectations and, and that is part of the process of accepting them. And you, you know what you're into. Yeah. You sure you know what you're into? Yeah, 28 <laughs> years of teaching I got a okay. pretty good idea. <laughs> so tell me about your teaching. Where did you teach? Oh, I've been in... By the way, Lionel Lakes is where Prison Fellowship Ministry is. Yeah. I've been in I've been in four school districts and the last eight years was up at Lino at the Corrections Facility, the juvenile program. So. See, I didn't know they had juvenile programs there. Yep, we actually have four juvenile programs there. <laughs> and then what's the best way to get a hold of Life Prep Academy? Our website is uh, www.lifeprepacademymn.com. Uh, they can call us at 763-203-2015, or they can email me at pam at lifeprepacademymn.com. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. When we started North Star Oasis, one of the goals that we had set, our staff, we had set the goal that we wanted to reach out into the community and show some of the great things that people are doing. And what Pam is doing at Life Prep Academy is just amazing. Yes, it's a ground floor opportunity. And I say opportunity because, you know, there are no throwaway kids. And as we've discussed with the protests that have occurred lately with the Black Lives Matter, well, so do homeless lives. Homeless lives matter. And my hat's off to Pam and the staff at Life Prep Academy. And I just want to let you know that, you know, she mentioned in there there's 100% funded by donations. That also means there's no government funding involved and not backed by a major organization. It's a 100% volunteer effort. And that means of the staff of seven that they have, nobody gets paid. They're all doing this a volunteer. There's a lot of needs. You've heard some of those needs. Uh, just want to make an appeal to you to go to their website and make a donation. Or in the case of some of the staff members here at North Star Oasis who have committed to, commi uh, to $20 a month for the next year. That's really to turn around somebody's life here in America, here in our own community. That's probably not too much to ask. So please go to our Twitter page, at North Star Oasis. Follow us. Uh, I did put up the link to Life Prep Academy. As a matter of fact, uh, the quote from Judy from Life Prep, uh, there may have been bad yesterdays, but there will be good tomorrows. And that should really be a good slogan for this organization because there will be plenty of good tomorrows for some great people uh, thanks to the assistance of the folks at Life Prep Academy. So with that, I do want to give you an update on the Brooklyn, New York uh, police officer shooting as we're talking about uh, whose lives matter and whose don't. The, um, it has been confirmed that the two officers who were shot uh, as I let off the program today, they have indeed passed away. So and again, you know, when we're talking about whose lives matter, cops' lives matter, homeless lives matter, and veterans' lives matter. And, you know, here we are at Christmas. So as we're talking about Christmas time, I wanted to show you, I tried showing this a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, uh, it, we were having some technical difficulties in that show. Um, oh, and I guess before I even begin to play, uh, play this, uh, last last week's show we had brought out um, we brought out the Burling, uh, the 
Canadian Pacific Railroad's um, holiday train. A huge success. And if you notice, in, if you watched last week's show, you know, in Hastings, they donated $4,500 to help people in Hastings. They donated $10,000 to help people in uh, the west side of the St. Paul, right here in our own viewing area. Hopefully next year or the year after, Canadian Pacific Rail will support Life Prep Academy. And I guess that's the goal. But in order to get there, they need your support now. And as we're at the holiday season, at the Christmas season, we're five days away from the day that uh, Santa Claus arrives and brings all this joy to all the go good little boys and girls. You know, the uh, Air Force Band, U.S. Air Force Band, we're at the Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum last year. And what they did was amazing. Again, we tried playing this for you uh, two weeks ago, but technical difficulties had presented us. So we're going to show it to you, and it's hopefully in its entirety now.
And that was your United States Air Force Band. That uh, Again, that was last year at um, the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum. I've worked with the Airmen of Note. I've worked with the Air Force Band this is back when we were deployed. And I'll tell you, they are some of the most talented musicians this side of the Marine Corps Band, which is known as the President's Own. Uh, all services have bands, and they do fabulous work, especially around this time of year. And so in this last uh, minute that we've got left of our show today, I just want to remind you that we're on Twitter. If you've got any Robin Williams USO show uh, or just Robin Williams uh, memories that you, you have, please uh, drop us a note at our Twitter at uh, North Star Oasis. Uh, please get out there and support Life Prep Academy. They're doing fabulous work and they really need your support. And then also... This is the season for giving. And just take a moment, please, in this uh, Christmas season, remember that Jesus is the reason for the season and that uh, this is the time to really do something special for your fellow man. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the Savior of the world was born. That's the reason why we celebrate. Whether or not you believe or not, to me right now is irrelevant. What really matters is you know, what, you're, what are you going to do to make this world a better place? And, and I say your belief to me is ir irrelevant because everybody's got their own beliefs. I personally believe in Jesus Christ. Not everybody does. But that's a subject for another show. But Christmas is coming on Thursday. So I want to wish you a Merry Christmas and see you next week.